Praise the Lord. Amen. It's good to be here. It was a, quite a ride coming up from Florida. The Google took me through a, off the beaten path, I should say. So my daughter got excited and she said, well, Dad, let's, let's re- make some recordings. We'll share it with, our, with all the other girls. I've got four girls. Um, and I'm really blessed. My wife wanted to be here. She's expecting. And so she's going through the roller coaster and a couple sick kids. So uh, she wasn't able to make it this time. Um, I want to thank the Vision Valley family for having me up. I, I really want to thank Pastor Tim DeVries as a great friend. Every time that I talk to him, I feel that I learn something in every conversation that I have with him. And that means a lot. I, I, I love information. I love the Lord. I love the Bible. And I appreciate his zeal for the Word of God. And he's always, he has a, a real teacher's spirit. And uh, he just loves doing that. And I love being part of that and sharing that with him. And uh, we've been spending some time together over uh, computers today and yesterday a little bit. And, um, boy, I didn't think he could lose his temper. No, I'm just kidding. I won't, you know? <laughs> Amen. Uh, what's interesting, so our church, we just celebrated our seventh um, anniversary as Law of Liberty Baptist Church, and if we rewind a little bit and we go back to the sixth year anniversary, Pastor DeVries was visiting with us, and we had scheduled that. We have him about the same time every year, and he comes and preaches and encourages, and we, went, we were going through one of life's storms. And as he often tells me, this is just God's story, and we get to be part of God's story. And we think it's our story. We like to read ourselves into the scriptures sometimes where we shouldn't. And, you know, he just goes, hey, this is all part of God's story, and you're part of it right now and what he's doing there. And we merged with a church that had been around for over 80 years, fantastic property, uh, abandoned by their pastor. The church was dying. The church was dead you know, half a dozen, a dozen folks coming, and uh, we were blessed to be able to, to merge and put some life into this church, and as far as I can tell, I'm the seventh pastor in that church, and we've given it its fourth name in merging. We just ended up taking our original name that we started about seven years ago, which was Law of Liberty. That comes out of the book of James. Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, that's the Bible. This is what I love about it. It, It's only the Word of God that has the perfect balance between freedom and His commandments. Anybody that has children understands that sometimes you give commandments to maintain freedom. You know, and there are some churches that have gone the way of pure liberty and they're missing some commandments, you know. And look, thank God we're not saved by the law or we'd all be in trouble, right? So we rejoice in the liberty that's in Jesus Christ. We're very thankful for that. And so, Pastor DeVries was actually there for the event for us at our sixth anniversary, which was the very day that we merged with that other church, and he was there to preach right after it. And what an encourager, and uh, one, of, one of the little old ladies there, actually, he met her years ago, kind of a, an interesting story. So, nonetheless, I'm very thankful for that. The heart of our church are some of the, the older generation. We have a lot of children in our church. We're outnumbered. Uh, good thing they haven't figured out how to vote. Otherwise, we'd probably be in trouble, you know. But the older generation is a very important part of church. I teach my children that we serve God until the end of our days. I teach my children that from the time we're in the womb to the time where you've got to carry me in, I want to be in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. That's where, I, where I'm in God's will and there's a blessing. And it is such a blessing to have the older generation there to encourage the younger generation, this is what we do. We are God's people. We are people of the book. We are people of gathering together to hear preaching, singing, worshiping God. One of the ladies in the church, Sister Norma Jean, she's one of the, the, like the heart of the church. She's been there for 65 years in this same church. She's seen it through different pastors and different names and another one of the and she helps so many ways. She's, she's now the, she helps with the accounting and stuff, which is great. Uh, Sister Sylvia, she's been there for many years. A soul winner. She used to run bus routes and awesome stories. Just a real encourager. And I'm very thankful for the families that God has given us. And uh, I want to encourage those that are elderly in this church, the elders, stick with it. I mean, this is it. This is what God has brought us together for. 
and I want to encourage you. Now, when I get back, I, I almost wasn't able to come because we have big plans this week. We're in Jacksonville, Florida, which is a very large territorially, but interestingly enough, we are, we're actually slightly smaller than Louisville. We're almost a million, and I guess Louisville's over a million. Does that sound about right? So we're actually slightly smaller, but there's a little city that we go to every year called Baldwin. And we've started the habit. We have certain cities, uh, McClenny, uh, Callahan, some of the outer skirts, uh, Hilliard. It's Hilliard, but we're in the south, so we just kind of blur it all together. Hilliard, you know. And Baldwin is a city that's literally minutes from the church. And we've been going there for years, even before our church moved. Where we're at now, we're five minutes or seven minutes from Baldwin. Baldwin is a very small community. And we have a soul winning marathon this Saturday. So I'm thankful for the opportunity to come and preach. And we got to get back down there. There are souls to save. There are doors to knock. In that little community, there are about 600 houses. And there's about 1,500 people. And every year, I want to see more soul winners. And I want to knock more doors. And I want to reach as many people there as we can. And Baldwin is an interesting place. There are a lot of poor people in Baldwin. A lot of foolish, foolish people. There's, there's sinners there, you know. There's crazy and ungodly and you could say even criminal. Baldwin is a bedroom community. People will live there and drive into Jacksonville to work. And so there's not a lot that, to do to make a living. And there's a lot of people there that find ways to kind of get in trouble. And we've noticed as we talk to some of them, there are some crazy people in Baldwin. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. There are some criminals and rude people and uneducated and uncivil and, I mean, poor people in Baldwin. But, you know, God tells us that he wants us to go to them as well. Now, if you have your Bible with me, I want you to go to, go to Romans chapter 1. I want to share a thought with you tonight. As we go to these uh, criminal, rude, uncivilized, lost people in Baldwin this weekend, it's on my heart. It's something I'm meditating on. And as I, I talk with your pastor with his vision, he has a big vision for this whole area, for the Ohio Valley. It's interesting, as I'm in Mount Washington, I'm also in Vision Valley. I don't know if, that's, if that makes it a plateau, if you're both on a mountain and in a valley. That means you can look up and you can also look down and there are people all around you that can be reached. And where you're at, it may not be where you're, where you're at forever, but God has you here for this time, for a particular reason. And I just want to encourage you in this. You, you probably know Romans 1.16, but first I want to look at verse 14. Romans 1 verse 14 it says... I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. Now look at verse 16 with me. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I want you to understand that we are a debtor to the Jew, the Greek, the barbarian, the wise, the unwise. And if this sermon had a title tonight, it would be Baptizing Barbarians. Baptizing Barbarians. Sometimes when we get in our church and we get in our little nook in life, we get real comfortable and we say, this is just right. And I've got the, my, my favorite people are around me and I'm comfortable and... God does put us in seasons and times where He wants us to be comfortable with where we're at and He wants us to enjoy and appreciate the blessings that He's given us. But sometimes we get too comfortable where we're not happy with change. And we need to go out and find some barbarians and get them saved, get them baptized, get them on fire for the Lord. As I meditate on Baldwin, Florida, this little city, in Baldwin, it's an interesting thing. If, if I don't know if any of you know the history of Jacksonville, the entire county is Duval County. And a few years ago, they decided to make the city limits the entire county. There was one stronghold that did not go along with it, and that was Baldwin. If you look at a map of Jacksonville, it's this big old shape, and then there's a little tiny square off to the west side. And that little tiny square is Baldwin. And the people around there mock it. They talk bad about it. 
I've even heard a preacher that preaches there that, that makes fun of the people in the town. And I, don't, I want to be clear. When I say they're poor and uneducated and rude and criminal, I'm not trying to be disrespectful to the individual. But what I'm looking at is God's call to us that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone, even to the people in Baldwin, Florida. Instead of making fun of Baldwin, Florida and saying, man, I'm glad I don't live over there. I'm glad I'm not one of those folks. We need to get a vision of seeing that there are people out there that if no one goes and preaches the gospel to them, they're going to go to hell. Baldwin, Florida has a Baptist church, but... It's just not the same. They preach that you have to be a good person, repent of your sins, get baptized. They preach lordship salvation. It may say Baptist on the sign, but they, they don't evangelize. They don't go out and preach the gospel. Their idea of evangelism is throwing you know, after football game parties for the teens and giving them you know, pizza and soda. But they're not preaching the gospel. In fact, they preach a false gospel. And it really bears on my heart when I think about it. There's 600 little old homes over there in this city that's been neglected. And now God's moved us even closer to that city. And I said, you know what? We're really going to ramp it up. We're going to knock doors. We're going to preach the gospel. We're going to reach the lost and help them in every way that we can. A few years ago, I was in a church and a good friend, his name was Kevin, Brother Kevin. His son... And his daughter were on their way of being in ministry. They were a big part of the church. They were teenagers. She would oftentimes play the piano in the church. Uh, his son would, uh, in the, on, we'd have men's preaching nights and he would preach. And uh, was a very smart kid, loved the Lord, knew the Bible well. Uh, but he told me the story of why he was in the church that I was in. Because the church he was previously in, they had ministry where they did soul winning. They went out running buses, bringing kids in so that they can hear of Jesus and hear the stories and they can hear the gospel. And one of the bus kids got saved and this brother Kevin said, we need to get him baptized. And the pastor said, well, 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 well you, know, we, you know, they're not really going to join the church. And he kind of, him and hauled around it and didn't really, wasn't clear. And, the, and finally Kevin just kept pushing him. And he's like, no, I mean, we're commanded to preach the gospel, get him saved, bring him to the church, get him baptized. Why can't we have this kid baptized, this bus kid. This bus kid was a barbarian. My pastor said, well, we, if, we, if we baptize them, next thing you know, they'll be coming to the church all the time. And you wouldn't want one of those kids to marry your daughter, would you? That pastor was a racist. Now, this wasn't in the South, oddly enough. You would expect that, you know. I mean, I know you guys don't have that problem here. And neither do we in Florida, right? I don't know. Doesn't it say in Acts 17 that he made all nations of one blood? But he didn't want this bus kid to get baptized. He didn't want him getting, being part of the church, joining and being a member. Because next thing you know, he might date your daughter. And that was, the, that was the final, like, you don't want him to date your daughter, do you? And Kevin angrily said, I'd rather him that's saved and on fire for the Lord marry my daughter than some kid that just that's spoiled and rich and doesn't want to do anything for the Lord. You know, we need to find the barbarians in our city, don't we? And there are barbarians everywhere, and we're, we're all uh, come from a different walk in life, and God has given us different gifts and abilities and talents, and it is, I want you to, I want you to remember, it is the gospel that is the power of God for salvation to everyone and there are plenty of people that will never be reached because somebody will just turn their nose and say, well, I mean, we're not going to reach them, are we? I think American Christianity has a big old blind spot right now. Well, if we don't go to war with the Koreans or the Russians or the Israelis or the Muslims, isn't it our job to preach the gospel to them? And look, I know we, we have problems in America. I know we have financial problems and economic problems. And I know that, that, that our government, I think, is against us and all that. And I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about the gospel tonight. And I want to talk about that it's our job to preach the gospel to everyone. And I want you to see your part in this vision. Don't you believe that if, if Pastor DeVries had the easy button and he could just say, push the button in every household gets a clear presentation of the gospel. Everyone in Mount Washington just push the button and they get it. Don't you think he'd push that button? 
you think you'd say, well, I mean, not, not that family. No, God forbid. We do have a big Christian blind spot these days where we're too worried about people that aren't quite like us. And I don't know, the last time I read my Bible, God's, God's country are a people that's not a people. It's not about my bloodline. It's not about my lineage. It doesn't matter who my parents were. It doesn't matter what my income level is. It doesn't matter what my zip code is. It's the power of God through the preaching of the gospel that can change lives. And God can use all of us in here in that part. We are, we are all different body members in this. And I want to give you a charge tonight. I want to give you a challenge. I want you to discover your part. Where you belong. How God can use you. What talents you have. Where God can really use you to reach other people. Yea, even some barbarians that you can reach with the gospel. And listen, the power, he's joking about the soundboard, the phantom power, the phantom power. There's no power here. Let me tell you something. If there's anything that I can leave with you tonight, it's going to come out of the Holy Scriptures or from the Holy Spirit. I have no power except what God can give me. And he's given me some pass- a passage that I want to share with you tonight. And I want to just expound this. The power is not in a big building. The power is not in thousands of people in attendance. The power is not in purple lights and a smoke machine. It's not in fancy, trendy graphics. The power is not in in all these. It's not in some big college degree. Plenty of churches today are, are trusting a different type of power. Well, the power is in a massive offering. If you just make your church look like a movie theater, it'll be popular. We have one of these churches near us where it's a Baptist church. Now, mind you, it was a Southern Baptist and they're wrong on the gospel and Attendance is dwindling. They say, here's what we're going to do. We're going to split it up and we'll have a traditional service early and then then we'll have the more, you know. Well, now there is no more traditional service. They painted the entire building dark gray on the outside. They painted it black on the inside. There are women that lead the preaching from the stage and they preach a false gospel. And listen, there's no power in that. There's no power in a rock and roll band. Not for the gospel. Not to deliver souls. Not to change lives. Hey, you want to fill a room? Yeah. Smoke, lights, mirrors, black walls, rock and roll. Are you appealing to the spirit or the flesh? Right? You've heard the saying, what you win them through, you win them to. Well, if you don't keep the rock and roll going, then you don't have an audience. I want to share a few verses here. Back up to verse number 10. Romans Chapter 1, look at verse number 10. Making request, if by any means, now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. And I want to tell you, so far it's been a prosperous journey coming here. I'm very thankful for uh, being able to come here. And I want to just tell you, look, we are on the same team. We are going to spend eternity with each other. And I want to help you find your part in the power of the gospel. If we know that the gospel can change lives, and we know that if it can just get to the right people, it can literally change their entire future. Not just their eternal destiny, but it also has the power to change your life here on this earth. Instead of turning our nose at people, oh, well, they're stuck in that little old city. Give them the gospel and let the Holy Spirit move in and work on the rest of it. I want to challenge you to find your part. We have a lot of, I told you about some of the ladies in our church, the heart of our church, uh, Miss Norma Jean and Sister Sylvia. They're too old to go out knocking doors and preaching the gospel anymore, but even Sister Sylvia a year ago tried. She went to Baldwin with us. It was very difficult for her. They pray for us now. You know, that's one of the greatest things you can do. If you can't get up and go out and preach the gospel, then I need you to be a prayer warrior. I need you to say, I'm going to pray for the people that will go. I'm going to pray that God would send more laborers here to this church. There are some some voids. There are some opportunities. There are some talent that's needed. God needs some talent over here and back there. And you know what? Out there doing this as well. And you need to start praying and trusting, praying and, and just saying, God, by faith, I'm asking you to help us have more people get here and on fire to reaching this lost community. And I need you to pray when you can. And I understand mamas a lot of times, they can't go out. They're with, they're with the kids when dad goes out. And I really believe they have such a great reward to look forward to. My sister Sylvia is always passing out church invites. 
She's always passed everywhere she goes. You know, you guys have something so special here. I want to encourage you. Tell people about it. There are people that are Christian, that are in church. They've been church their whole life, and they still have a big old void because they are not saved, and they know it. They know they're not settled. Look at verse number 11. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end ye may be established. This is quite a statement. Paul is saying, I really want to come and see you. I want to give you a spiritual gift. And I don't think Paul is saying this arrogantly as if I'm up here and let me give you down here something. He's just saying, man, let me share what I've learned. Let me tell you about the spiritual gifts. And, and he does. He goes on in a few chapters and he names some of these gifts. And there are many different types of gifts like preaching and teaching and helping and encouraging and giving is one. But showing love is one and showing mercy to others. Those are some of the gifts that make a church great. A church is not the walls. Uh, a church is not just the preacher. A church is the spirit that's in the people, how we treat each other. You know, in John 13, 35, he said, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. The people outside of the church look at Vision Valley, how we treat each other inside the church. And that's when they say, well, that is a pretty good church. They're not like the others. They're not hypocrites. Some of the talents, the gifts that God wants to give you is love and mercy, being hospitable. I mean, these are some of the things that God, hey, you can grow in this gift. He wants everybody to have several gifts, multiple gifts. But many people never grow up into their gifts. You know that being an encouragement, being a motivator, that's a spiritual talent that God will give you to be able to help other people. If you're involved in ministry, you understand that. If you're one of the ones that uh, goes out soul winning, or goes out on the buses, does Sunday school, if you're doing part of the ministry here, and you, and you get highly involved, and you get people, yeah, they said they're going to come, and then, they, and then they don't come. Well, welcome to the ministry. Now you're sharing what it feels like to be a pastor. There are many times I just tell somebody, I'm like, you're an encouragement to me. And they're like, me? They see it like, I'm, I'm just a weaker brother and I barely make it here. I'm like, yeah, but when you show up, it encourages me. I need you guys to encourage your pastor. He has a big vision. And I believe God's behind him on it. I believe God has a big plan. You know, another, another, we're, we're called to rejoice with those that rejoice. We're called to weep with those that weep. That's part of your spiritual gifts. This is something you can do. We can share in these things as a family. I want to give you a spiritual gift. I want to give you a, a vision for the lost, for the barbarians. And I know you guys already are, are doing the labor. But I think God wants you to take it another level. I think there's another mile to go. I think there's another burden to pick up. And every burden you pick up, let me tell you, God's right there with you. Look at, look at verse number 12 with me. That is that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto. That means he was prevented. I was trying to come. I want to give you a gift. I want to help you grow. I've got big plans for your area, but I was prevented. Things were happening. I couldn't make it, right? And then he says, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. God wants more fruit. Now, when he says fruit, he's talking about reproducing yourself spiritually. You're a Christian. Make another Christian. You have that power. He's given us of the Holy Spirit. You realize the very day that Jesus resurrected, He breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And then He said, Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted. Whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. When you knock on the door and preach the gospel, or when you're telling somebody the way to heaven, and they say, Nah, you know, I'm not really interested in that. You're saying, Hey, listen, buddy, then you are keeping your sins on your account instead of it being put on Jesus. Now, He's already paid. Which gives us the authority through the power of the Holy Spirit and the gospel. I can say, hey, since you have trusted in Christ, you understand that all of your sins have been paid for. What great power that we have. I want you to understand, most people are lost and they're carrying this big old burden on their back and they're beat up and, and they just know, they're wore out, they know that they're not right with God. One of the guys at our church, he's preaching in my stead tonight and he, I had specifically asked him a few months ago to 
that I wanted him to re-preach a sermon that he preached seven years ago. It was called, Are There Few That Be Saved? And he is, he's going to go, and I'm, I'm sure he'll, I know he's got some plans to change the sermon, but it's still a really good one. I listened to part of it um, on the way. But he, he goes through the statistics. How many people are in the world, right? Now it's almost, what, eight point something billion, you know, nine trillion, I, I forget, right? But then he's like, how many people are in the world? Okay, now have those people, how many of them at least claim Jesus? Well, that's maybe, what, a quarter, a third? And he's going to go through the statistics and show that most people are not saved, they're not trusted. Well, the Catholics, what do they say you have to do to be saved? Well, good works, penance, you know, pray to a statue. Most people are lost, and we can help them. And he says here that, that I might have some fruit among you also. I want you to get this vision that uh, when you get more saved souls, when you see people trust on the, on the power of Jesus Christ, right? With the power of God unto salvation. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And we either believe that everyone part or we don't. Because there are people that you know that are in another religion or another denomination and you know they're lost and they're going to put on a smile for you and they're going to pretend they might even say the name of Jesus. But you know in your heart that they're trusting in their own works. And you need to just tell them, let me tell you something. At Vision Valley, things are different. We're not like these other churches. This is a place where lives are changed. This is a place where we know that we have hope. This is a place where doubts are dissolved as we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is something different here. Amen. You can give them that promise. You can give them that assurance. I understand that some of you may never be able to go out and knock doors and preach the gospel. But you play a part. Not everybody in the military shoots a gun. Right? There's support staff. We need prayers. We need supporters. We need motivators and encouragers and those that can help prep in any way. We need those to go out and just, hey, you know, you go to the grocery store, give them a track. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them, I'm telling you, if you haven't been to a Baptist church in a while, you've got to come see this one because this is different. I mean, get them curious. Get them excited. Share your enthusiasm with them. You get them here and then let the preach and let the, let the Lord work through your pastor to reach them. You think about David and Ziklag, if you know that story. where They came and took everything and he went back to get them and they came back and uh, the people, it said, they stayed with the stuff. And David rewarded them just as well as the others that went to war. We all reward alike. And I really believe that when I get to heaven and I, and I say, Lord, I've been sowing in for years. And I say, you know, I'm going to have a, whatever my reward level. And I'm going to look over and there's going to be my wife and all those times that she was training the children as she should and watching the house so I can go soul winning. She's going to be right there. I don't know. She might right there. I don't know. I thank God for the, for the ladies that support the soul winning and the elderly and those that whatever whatever your part is, I want you to find your part because frankly, every soul matters. Every soul matters. And God isn't willing that any should perish. Isn't that what he says? You think he's going to rejoice when, oh, a Muslim went to hell? Yeah! Do you think? No. Maybe American Christianity will. Not one, not one soul will he rejoice. We live in a time where people just don't care anymore. Love is waxing cold. They don't care about children. They give my wife a hard time. Oh, are all those yours? Don't you know what causes that? What, what you're expecting? How many more are you going to have? You know, as many as the Lord will give me. Which one do you want me to get rid of? Look in their face and tell them that they're not worth keeping. Why don't you do that, right? Well, as a Christian, why don't we do the same thing? And those kids over there, they're nothing but trouble. They're no good for nothing, rotten, worthless. Ooh, that means they need the gospel. They need Jesus. I can't reform their attitude without giving them the Holy Spirit first. And I can't change their doctrine or their philosophy until the Holy Spirit's living inside of them. And once they understand the power of God 
is in the gospel unto salvation to everyone. And once they see that, listen, I really believe that there's, if, if we'll just take this attitude of giving it to those that don't deserve it, because I don't deserve it. We know God that works amazing miracles, and one of the biggest miracles He's ever accomplished was forgiving me and saving me. And I don't deserve that. And if I'll take that gift and I'll give that to somebody else, you never know where that person's going to go for the Lord. You may see some snot-nosed kid in the hood that turns out to be a great preacher or a soul winner, a life changer. Wouldn't you like to be said when you stand before the Lord that He says, thank God that you changed lives. That's what we're called to do with our time. And He's given us the power to do it. It's not with your intellect. It's not with your good looks. Come on, amen. <laughs> it's with the Gospel. That's where the power's at. And sometimes we forget that. In fact, sometimes we're, we're ashamed of it. We're ashamed of it. Because we're fleshly, human. We get mad. We cut them off in traffic. <laughs> cut in front of me, buddy. Who do you think you are? And then it's like... Ooh, I wonder if they'll see the church bumper sticker. <laughs> you know, that's one way to evangelize, you know. You get a call. I'm one of your people. Oh, oh really? Red truck? Oh, no. You know. <laughs> look at verse 13 with me one more time. He says, there at the end, just look. He says, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. He has a plan. Hey, I want some fruit. I want to see some growth. I want to see some souls. I've seen it in other nations where there's Gentiles, and he's coming from a guy that used to be a Jew, who looked down on the Gentiles, and he says, I don't care where you're at. I want to see some fruit there too. There's fruit. It's possible anywhere. It doesn't matter. It's the power of God. It goes to everyone. And he's not satisfied with seeing one go. I mean, America, we're in trouble politically, aren't we? We've got South American migrant workers coming right up through the border doing whatever they want. And boy, our government's going to pay them. And I mean, they smell, they speak another language. and You know, they need the gospel too. They need the gospel too. Maybe God's bringing them here because America for years had a reputation of being a missionary nation that preached the gospel. You know, there's preachers. Now there's a preacher in, in uh, Mexico. One of our families in our church, their son, is employed by him to be a full-time soul winner in America. A, let me say it again. A Baptist preacher in Mexico is paying people to preach the gospel in America. He's sending missionaries and planting churches in America. Well, they can't do that. Ameri We're the ones that send. Yeah, we used to. Until we've given up and we quit caring about every soul. We have that blind spot. Well, not over there and not to those people. We need to see our part and catch this vision. Which one do you want to send to hell? He doesn't want to send one. He died for all, and I look at the ghetto, I look at the hood. There's a whole generation lost. There's some apartment complexes we've adopted. We go soul caroling every year. We started this back several years ago. Instead of just singing Christmas carols, then we want to preach the gospel and see some souls saved and praise the Lord every year now. For seven years, we've seen, well, we're coming up on what will be our seventh year in our Christmas season. So this will be our seventh year doing it. We see souls saved every time we go out. We eat Christmas carol, and then we sing soul, we, we, we preach the gospel. We get some kids out there. Sometimes we'll give away candy canes or something, whatever. You know, we try something different every year. We give the kids these necklaces with the bulbs and the lights just to catch their attention. This past year, we had several kids that brought like ukuleles and stuff. It was really fun. It's kind of neat. And we've kind of adopted this one apartment complex. It's sad. There's, there's a murder like every three months there. It's poverty stricken. You can show up at any time and there's kids playing out in the street. They're listening to this horrible, ungodly music that is programming their brain, telling them to live a life of drugs and violence and murder. 12 year old kid shooting another kid. Lady laying in her bed, third story of the apartment, gets shot in her rib because there's somebody down there doing a drug deal and somebody gets shot. 
It's a, it's a horrible place, but it breaks my heart when I think about it. There's a whole generation lost. I feel like there's two or three generations lost, and a lot of it has to do with the entertainment. What they're watching, what they're listening to, it's programming their mind, it's telling them to live this horrible life. You're not anybody unless you do this. Oh, you want to get out of the ghetto, you've got to sell drugs. And, and it's, it's just, it breaks my heart. And we go in there to preach the gospel to them. Who will go and save these souls? And I know you guys have communities just like it. Pastor DeVries told me about his plan. He's got a, a soul winning marathon coming up where you guys are going into Louisville. Is that right? I heard that was a really tough city. I heard there were, I heard there were sinners in there. Are, are you? <laughs> I mean, that's pretty bad. Are, are you sure that you want to do that? You know, we, we often joke about it, and a lot of our guys will, you know, carry protection and stuff, you know, weapon or whatever, and, if you've got this, the Lord's on your side, and you have nothing to fear. I have noticed that sometimes you go into the poor neighborhoods, and they have a high regard, they have a high respect. When somebody comes in with a Bible, they actually have a respect for them because you're not like the others that are pushing them toward abuse or using them or whatever it is. I really believe that there's power in the gospel. Look at verse 13 with me. At the end there again, he says, that I might have some fruit among you also. There's somewhere else he wants to go. And here's the goal. I want you to see your part in getting more fruit. Not just here, but the next city over. What was it Barzell and Shepherdsville and Louisville? Louisvillians. Are they villains? Is that, was that how you say it? Is that right? Uh, man, that sounds scary. Are you sure you want to go into there? I can't imagine people living there. Those are they're barbarians. And yet God has given us the power of the gospel not just to save their soul. All their sins have been paid for. But when the Holy Spirit moves in, God wants to change their life as well. And the gospel has the power to change their life. And when it gets in, and they start working it out and telling everybody, man, you don't understand, something's changed. I believe in Jesus Christ. He died for my sins. I have nothing to fear. I know where I'm going. In fact, now I know that who I belong to. I know where I don't want to go. Now, it doesn't happen right away. There are a lot of people out there that it takes a few years to begin to grow and really uh, get moving for the Lord. But I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. No matter how poor they are, how abused they've been, how sad they are, it doesn't matter. We're going to go to Baldwin this weekend. Y'all pray for me. Let's read verse 14. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. Being a debtor, that means we owe something to the unwise people. The people you say, well, they're too ignorant to understand. Don't worry about that. You let the Holy Spirit work through you. You give them the gospel, the verses that God can really work with. We have a job and so many people, I mean, you're in the grocery store. Well, I mean, not, not that person. I mean, they've got, is that a piercing in their... I mean, you know, it's like, I mean, there's some we are purple hair, piercings, tattoos everywhere. You know what they need? That's a cry for help. That that you ought to see somebody like that and say, now that's a perfect candidate because if they get saved, they're going to be on fire for God. You think he, they're serving Baal much now? Wait till they get saved; they'll really serve the Lord. People like that when they when they get saved, a lot of times, they, I mean, they're very thankful. They're indebted. They want to work for the Lord all of their days. I have some friends like that with tattoos. And can you imagine somebody knocking on, oh, there's a scary looking guy with tattoos. And it's like, he's here to tell me about Jesus? It forgives sinners? Now listen, kids, if you don't have a tattoo on your face, don't get one. You don't need that for your testimony, okay? <laughs> but don't withhold preaching the gospel to somebody just because of their appearance. What did Jesus say? You judge unrighteous judgments because you judge by appearance? That's a cry for help. There's a lot of people giving that cry for help. There's a lot of unsaved Christians, and we have the power. This church is different. The gospel is powerful. You're surrounded by lost churches. We're driving up, and we're going through these country roads, and oh, cool, look at that little old country church. Ch church of Christ. We come up, there's, oh, look, there's another one. Ch church of Christ. There's an oh, ch ch stone church of Christ. For those that don't know, I mean, the church of Christ is a stronghold. It is a spiritual stronghold in this area. And there's only about half a dozen things you have to do to be saved, according to them, right? 
You've got to live a good life and turn it all around. And of course, the water's going to wash off your sin when you go under the water. But there you sin again. Well, you've got to wash it off again. I mean, talk about putting somebody in bondage. I mean, around here, traditionally, people grown up in that. I mean, imagine where just every day they're like, I know I fall short. I can never do it. I'm just going to pretend to be good when I go to church. Because if they find out that I've sinned again, they're going to say, I need to get rebaptized. And I've done that 14 times. Don't want to do that again. <laughs> right? I mean, God forbid. I mean, this is a stronghold in this area. And knowing that, you need to just understand you have a greater power with the gospel than they do. And you can share that very power with everyone. Hey, do you guys go to church? Oh, cool. Where do you go? Oh, okay. Church of Christ. Christian church. Did you know that Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel? Did you know that baptism isn't even part of getting saved? Can I show you from the Bible? I mean, talking about like it's like hitting somebody in the forehead. What? Well, I've heard it my whole life. You've got to repent of your sins and be baptized and confess and don't, don't play any musical instruments, right? Some of them do that. You know what I'm talking about? You heard about the Church of Christ elder that got he got shunned, he got expelled for playing the air drums on his on his steering wheel, you know? <laughs> they don't have church having an instrument, that's not godly, you know. <laughs> So, I mean, when you're, when you're so stuck in your works, the Mennonites would be another one. The Amish would be another one. People say, wow, they're just, they really, have you seen their craftsmanship? Have you seen what their work? And I say, well, yeah, they better work hard if that's how they think they're getting to heaven. You better have a reputation of work. Well, we have a, we have a reputation of faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. And because we're saved and we're thankful here, you notice it says that we are a debtor. You are indebted. You know, it's your reasonable service to lay down your wants in your lifestyle, in your free time. And there are probably a lot of areas. I mean, we could all find an extra hour in our week if we really wanted to. Turn the tube off. Put your phone down. Quit gossiping. Quit worrying about everybody else's problems. Go talk to your neighbor. Look at verse 16, 15. So as much as in me is... I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Now, if you go back to the original Greek, there where it says Rome, it's actually a word that means Louisville. <laughs> you, you, mean, you mean Louisville? I mean, now, no, seriously, th all right, think about it. Can you imagine in Paul's time, right? He's in Jerusalem. Boy, he knows Jerusalem. He knows he's a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He can, I mean, he can spout verses better than the guys that are doing the service. That's his area. That's his territory. That's his specialty. He studied it his whole life. We know he's a zealot. He knows more probably about the Old Testament than most guys out there, and that's where he wanted to be. That's not what God wanted. God wanted to kick him out of that and send him somewhere else. And then he comes to this point in his ministry where he's like, man, I've seen fruit over here, and I've seen fruit over there, and I've seen fruit over here. I'm coming to you. I want to see some fruit over here. I want to impart unto you some spiritual gift. I want to give you boldness and the power of the gospel. I want you to understand that God wants you to grow up spiritually, and He wants you to add to your gifts. Can you imagine come Christmas time, and it's like, wow, there's 15 things, and you're like, eh, I'll try one. Yeah, but there's more there. There's gifts for you. All you have to do is pick it up and open it. Eh, it's not, it's not for me. It's not my calling. We'll let somebody else do that. Paul, in his zeal at this point, he's saying, he's been through a lot already up to this point that he's writing this. And he says, I've got to get to Rome. Rome, they were expelling Jews at this point. Rome, they were so pagan and perverse and defiled. Who would want to go there? Man, let, I'm just going to go out to the woods where I'm safe. I can see them coming when they come up the hill, right? Not Paul. He says, I'm going in the thick of it. There are more souls there. And if I can get a couple of them on fire for the Lord, some of those Romans can then get, I mean, the Greeks and the barbarians and the Scythians. And, I mean, and the list goes on. I mean, that was the melting pot at the time. That was the political headquarters. And he went there to preach to the wise and to the unwise. He wanted to reach the servants and the masters. What an interesting concept that not only did he want to go to the worst place for a Christian, he was excited. Man, I'm going to go there. There's some fruit in there. Let's go get it. Yeah, but don't you know that's dangerous? You know what kind of soil they have over there? Go with me to, go with me to Luke chapter 4. I want you to see something. Go to Luke chapter 4.
Look at verse number 18 when you get there. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Who was Jesus anointed to preach to? The poor. Why does He say that so many times? Hey, and I know most of us are probably fairly well off being in America, but we're still technically poor. There's no one in here that's a one percenter or a two percenter. But there's people that are worse off than us. They're poor and lame and criminal and immigrant and ignorant and smelly and sinners. Paul had this attitude that he didn't care about the flesh. And what we have to do is get this spiritual vision. And we need to start seeing people in a spiritual sense. Too many times we see them in a physical sense. Oh, I, I should make friends with that guy because you know that'd be a good business connection. If I had a friend like that, I could borrow their what, their boat, their jet ski. We need to start seeing people for the spiritual value. There are people that are poorer than us, below us in our stature economically that can do mightier things for the Lord and God sent us to them to be a blessing to them to impart some spiritual gift to give them some zeal for the Lord to get them on fire and it starts by giving them the power which is preaching the gospel so they get saved and once they get saved the Holy Spirit's going to move in and begin to activate those natural gifts that they have and then as they submit themselves they'll get more gifts and more opportunities there are people here that you guys can reach that I will never see. And as you guys depart and go somewhere else, there are people that you can reach that Pastor DeVries will never see. And I love the zeal of this church, and I'm really thankful for the people I've been able to talk to. I love it. It's exciting. But there's another step you've got to take. There's another city to go to. There's another block you've got to go to. Jesus says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. That's the filling of the Holy Spirit. That word anointing is dealing, that, that's what made Him the Christ. And then He says, as my Father sent me, so send I you. And He breathed on them and gave them the Holy Spirit. We have the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit that we're saved. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. And He wants to work through us, but we have to submit to His will. We've got to work for Him. We've got to stop walking in the flesh and walk in the Spirit. Then He can use us. Instead of judging unrighteous judgment and <clears throat> looking down on the poor, when you say, ooh, look at them. I see their cry for help. I know what can help them. I know where the power is at that can change their life. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus came to help and to heal and to lift people up. And now he's sending us to do the same thing. When somebody's hurt and broke, that's an opportunity. If you will, go to Mark chapter 5. It doesn't matter if Church of Christ. It doesn't matter if they're a Democrat. It doesn't matter if they're a foreigner. It doesn't matter what their economic status is. And look, I'm a conservative, gun-toting, American-loving Christian. I'm a Bible-thumping Baptist, and I think we need to close the borders, and I think we need to stop sending all our money to these foreign wars, and I have some political views. I think we need to stay out of that mess and worry about our own country. And I mean, just our, 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 the banking system is a fraud, and our government, I mean, we've got some problems we need to deal with in our house, and it just makes me wonder. I got this thing in the mail the other day. In Florida, the number one cause of murder in Florida right now is abortion. 88,000 abortions. And we won't worry about gun laws. We live in troubled times. I want you to see this in Mark chapter 4 because we have the power. Mark 5, I'm sorry. Mark 5. We have the power. We have the power to make a change in somebody's life. Verse number 1, Mark 5, he says, And they came over unto the other side of the sea, unto the country of the Gadarenes. And when, the, when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. And let me tell you this, I think just about everybody that's unsaved probably has an unclean spirit. The Bible says that they are taken captive by the devil at the devil's will. 
you're permanently filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't believe you can be possessed, but I believe you can open the door to the devil. We're warned about that. Well, the lost, it's not so. They don't have that hedge of protection from God. The devil can come and he knows exactly how to entice them and take a hold of them and use them for his will. And so here's a, man, here's a man overtaken by this unclean spirit. He says, a man with an unclean spirit who had in his dwelling among the tombs and no man could bind him, no not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains and the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. Now, this is the kind of guy that needs the gospel. Nobody can tame him. This is a wild man. He's crazy. He's homeless. He's naked. He stinks. He's bloody. We don't want somebody like that coming to our church. I won't give them an invite. Don't we do that? Unrighteously? Don't we have that tendency? Homeless, possessed, naked, diseased, bleeding, crazy. <laughs> For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth. To the homeless, to the crazy, to the possessed, to the bleeding, to the naked. They need help. That's a cry for help. Well, Jesus can help. And why would we be ashamed of the solution? If I saved your life in a fire, would you... Would you be ashamed to say it in public? Too many times we get caught, well, now's not the time. Now's not the place. But this, this is work. Who gave you the job? Speak up! Even if he's homeless, a shelter won't help. Right? If he's possessed, counseling won't fix the problem. It won't. Well, he's naked. We'll take him down to the Goodwill and get him some clothes. Won't fix the problem. Well, he's diseased. If we can just get him some meds, won't solve the problem. Well, he's bleeding. He needs some health care. That's not the problem. He's crazy. We need to get a psychi psychiatric event. Won't solve the problem, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power. This is it. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And this is the solution that God has called us to give. And it's easy. It's easier than we think a lot of times. We do a soul winning school every quarter or every six months at our church of training people up and helping them get ready to learn how to give the gospel. We have several teenagers just this past week. We had two teenagers that got their first soul saved. And I was rejoicing with them. And I'm excited for that. I mean, it's really exciting when you see this and hear it. Most people are worried that they're not skilled enough. I don't know enough verses. They think, they think they're going to knock on the door and it's going to be Richard Dawkins. And he's going to be like, prove to me the Genesis chapter 1. You know, <laughs> it doesn't really work that way. <laughs> Last year, two years ago, I did a soul winning school and I called it How to Get a Christian Saved. It's a contrary title, but I'm trying to provoke your thought. Most people that you get saved, they're going to believe the Bible is the Word of God. They're going to believe Jesus is the Son of God. But unfortunately, they're also going to believe, well, surely if I don't do something, or if I go back to my old ways, then I would lose it. And they're lost. And they know it. And we can help them with that. We can give them their assurance. Look at verse 5. And always... Night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. What a statement. Jesus right away said, For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. The story goes on. There's some pigs. Put us in the pigs. Don't throw us in hell. And so he throws them in the pigs. The pigs you know, commit suicide. They go to the barbecue, right? Uh, look at verse 18. No, look at verse 14, uh, 15, rather. And they came to Jesus to see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and 
clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And they said, oh, we know who that guy is. But he's different. He's sitting still, and he's holding his peace. And he's not crazy, and he's not possessed, and he's not bleeding, and he's not naked. This man's different. I want you to understand God has called us as believers to go out and to change lives. And it's not about what we give them physically. It's about what we impart unto them spiritually. We have the power in the Gospel. And when we give that to them and they receive it, it changes everything. It changes everything. The real power is in giving them the truth of the Gospel. It changes lives. And look, this is not a change life Gospel. Well, if you don't really see a change, they're not saved. That's not true. Any one of you, if I saw you on your worst day in your worst moment, I could judge your works that I could see and say, well, surely they're not saved, but they're doing this, this, and this. Well, thank God for the miracle of salvation. That true love that He loves us while we were yet sinners. We're still sinners, and He's paid for us. Until we leave this body, we're going to have weaknesses in the flesh, and we're going to stumble, but our testimony is, praise the Lord, I'm saved, because the power is in the Gospel. And now we take that to others. Look at verse 18. And when he was come unto the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Boy, now, this is neat. When somebody really gets saved and they want to come to church. Again, coming to church is not a sign of being saved. But when they do, instead of being like those that were afraid, saying, get out of our city. What would you do to our pigs? You get somebody saved and they come to church and they smell. And oh, isn't that, Wasn't that that one kid that got arrested last year? I would say, yeah, praise the Lord. Isn't that awesome? The power's in the gospel. Instead of being the skeptic and opposing, now he wants to come to church, prayed with him that he might be with him. Verse 19, Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath compassion on thee. What an interesting statement. Hey, go back to your family. They know you were crazy. They know you were possessed. They know the old you. And you go back and tell them what Jesus Christ has done for you. I'm excited to say that when we go to Baldwin, Florida this week, I'm just praying the Lord would just give me a soul. There's somebody there that I can change their life with the power of the gospel. And I may not be able to change their hairdo or their funny t-shirt or their political ideas. I may not be able to give them a better job or a better place to live. I can't change the quality and the caliber of the family that's raising them and training them, but I know this. If I'm willing to open my mouth and preach the gospel, I can give them the power of God. Go home to thy friends. Look at verse 20. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. Go back to Romans 1 and I'll just finish there. This man, everything changed for him. Everything changed. His whole life had changed at this point. And I want to just show you this. You have that power as well. We, a few years ago, we did this thing in November. You know, you ever heard of No Shave November? He's like, amen. He's like, I do it all year long. <laughs> Pastor DeVries is like, not happening. <laughs> Brother, watch what you're saying up there. <laughs> no shave November, right? One of, the, one of the guys in the church said, hey, I got an idea. Let's call it no shame November. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. What are we going to do? Every day after work, I'm going I'm to spend an hour and I'm not going to be ashamed. I'm going to go out of my way. I'm going to withhold eating food or whatever i got to do. And I'm going to go every day for November and try to preach the gospel to somebody. It would be awesome if I could say I got somebody saved every day. But I at least want to try. And I don't want to be ashamed in November. We did that a few years ago. It was awesome. It, really, it was cool. It was neat. Had visitors from it and everything else. What an encouraging thought. I love the fact that Pastor Dries always has something happening here. This is a church that's moving and growing. It's not stagnant. He's not happy to be on the plateau. He says, this is where God has us. We're in the valley to learn a lesson. And from here we have a vision. We can see those that are below us that we can still reach. And we can see there's other things ahead. He has a vision and I want you to get behind him on it. I thank God for what God's done through Pastor DeVries. And I thank Him for His friendship and His steadfastness. I thank Him for the truth. I think I'm just thankful that every time I talk to Him, I feel like I learn something. And He's not afraid of the crazy guy either. He's not afraid of the barbarians. Barbarians? Yeah, come on in. We've got a place for you. 
That's the way it ought to be. I want you to see this, though, that you have this power. Read with me verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Do you know what that's saying? You can be righteous with God. That barbarian can be righteous with God when you share your faith. From faith to faith. You tell them, and and look, this isn't a test. I'm going to tell you how I I turned my life around. It's not about your testimony. It's about what Jesus did. Oftentimes at the door. Well, I used to believe something like that, but can I show you, you know, somebody else show me from the Bible what it says. Can I show you what the Bible says? Are you willing to give them the faith that you have as a gift? Man, have I got something for you? Well, that's really good. I, 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 it's, you know, I tell a Catholic, I run into Catholic, and I'll say, hey, man, that's good. Uh, you guys believe the Bible, and you try to live right, and you love families, and that's great. But I'm Baptist. We're a little bit different. Can I show you what the Bible says? I want to encourage them to listen to the gospel. I want to become all things to all men. The light, so that they also can have the power, and I want to share my faith with them, because every Catholic that's trusting in their own works and their sacrament, they know they're lost. They're not settled. They're not happy. They don't have joy. And no matter what the religion is, he's telling us here, you're not ashamed of the power, well then, share your faith. Share your faith. Are you ashamed at the grocery store? Are you ashamed to be one of those ones that leaves one at the gas pump? Let's say you're littering. <laughs> Put it on the... Are you ashamed? Are you ashamed to tell somebody? Because there are barbarians. There are Romans. There are Louisvillians. You guys have a soul winning marathon coming up over there? First time you've done this, right? Going that far. I know you reach other cities on a regular basis. I want to encourage you guys to get part, be part of that. Now, I'm not saying everybody get on that bus. But I'm saying everybody pray for that bus. Would you pray for the people in Louisville? Do you realize the average income in Louisville is very low? And that means there's a lot of children that aren't getting love, they're not getting attention, they're not getting good food, they can't think straight. They go to public school where, the, where maybe they're being indoctrinated into something that goes against what, what, what the Bible says, and they're under attack. The devil is attacking them. But I thank God Pastor DeVries has a vision for even the barbarians. Yeah. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you so much, and Lord, I just ask that you would help us all to remember that you've called us to preach the gospel. Lord, I know that you have a great vision for this church and the surrounding cities both large and small, both rich and poor. Lord, I just ask that you would use this time to let the Holy Spirit, Lord, just to to do your work. Convince us, Lord, that there are things that we can do to pray, to invite, to prospect, to preach the gospel. Lord, I believe that there are those in here you have a calling on to uh, go out and win their first soul this year. I pray that you would encourage them right now. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity. I just pray that uh, it would be successful in your eyes. I ask this in Jesus' name.